All right. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you've got your uh, notice and you know that I'm online and we are good to go anytime. Lots to talk about this morning. So I want to get uh, right to it. As soon as I see some people hopping on board, uh, then I'll get to the topic of the day. I'm going to debunk the DNA diet, metabolic typing diets and nonsense like that. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the most relevant nutritionist in history and what he had to say about certain things. And I'm going to start off with a client email. But uh, right now, I'm just uh, waiting on people to uh, come on board. And uh, you think you're coming on board fast and furious. Uh, remember, everybody, hit your share button. The topics that I discuss are important out there in the world. Um, hey, Germany, happy to have you aboard. Uh, people from all over the world tuning in every week, which is great. Uh, lots to talk about today. So, um, yeah, as usual, um, stirring it up and uh, trying to convey some knowledge out there to open minds, which is hard to do. Um, and we are going to uh, get on with it. So, um, yeah, people hopping on board. Hey, Mike and Donna. Hey, Adrian. So, uh, good. Good. People are hopping on board uh, pretty quickly, so I'm glad all is working out. So uh, one of the things I um, want to get to uh, right away is a client email example that I wanted to use about proper mindset. So I printed out uh, one of my uh, typical client check-ins uh, for you um, to learn from in terms of um, proper mindset. So, yeah, we got South Africa, we got uh, Edmonton, we got a, a, a world, a worldwide uh, following going, and that's great. Just keep hitting your share button, though, folks. So, yeah, my client email, I have a client who's doing really well, very successful, dropping weight, leaning out, uh, doing really, really well. And I wanted to use his check-in as an example of mindset, okay? So, um as someone who's been successful from the get-go. And I never know when someone joins how they're going to be from the get-go. It's something that unfolds. It's a process like anything else. So here's his uh, feedback. Coach, I'm in week 11 of my current program. And then and then uh, he says a little more stuff. And then he says, uh, training-wise, the plan is the plan is the plan. And then he talks about his training. And then he says, diet-wise, the plan is the plan is the plan. And the reason I wanted to read this is I love this so much because he's got the successful mindset of simplicity. The plan is the plan is the plan. He says that for both training and diet. And it's no wonder he's doing really, really well because that is a mindset, right? It's a mindset switch. I compare that uh, to people who write me and say, oh, I want to do anything to make the results and you're my last hope and this and that. And then within a couple of weeks, they'll email me with things like, uh, is it OK if I change this to this? Is it OK if I do this instead of that? And what about if I have this instead of this? And nothing is the way I present it to them. They want to adopt things. And then they'll say things like I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And then a couple of weeks down the road, oh, well, uh, Eating this many meals is inconvenient and uh, cooking all my meals. Well, that's not practical. Well, since when is a long term goal and change in lifestyle convenient or at first practical? They become practical when you practice them as lifestyles. So the reason I wanted to read all this stuff um, is the proper mindset. So hopefully you're getting that here. I can't see your emoticons, folks, but if uh, this is resonating with you, by all means, make a comment. And then uh, more to the point. His follow-up email was this. Um, I forgot to say, Coach, something must be working because I've had far more comments this week about my apparent weight loss, so it's now obviously noticeable to everybody. But sadly, most of the comments are negative. People are asking if I'm okay, if I feel okay. When I say I'm fine and it's all a program by my coach and accounted for, they sort of looked at me like they're daft and, and they say, oh, I must be obsessed and blah, blah, blah. I have to tell you, these comments are from long-term uh, fellow office workers. Uh, they've worked in an office for 40 years like me, not taking care of themselves, and they have the bodies and lack of mobility to show for it. So it doesn't really bother me at all. They haven't had the first idea about uh, what I'm doing. 
I mention it only to illustrate that something has to be working because all the people seem to be noticing. It's all good on my part, but I've listened to you speak about the so-called peanut gallery before, but I never really experienced it till now. I guess it's the same sort of thing, but on a smaller scale and it's new to me and I find it very interesting. So I wanted to get that out there because it takes sometimes a strong mind because of peer pressure. A lot of people don't like when the balance is upset and someone else uh, starts making progress, transforming their lives, their bodies for the better. You get a lot of negativity and jealousy and green monster. And if you're a weak person, you can become susceptible to the peer pressure. So people see you making progress and at the office and then all of a sudden they're shoving cookies in your face and cake in your face and it's so-and-so's birthday and just have a bite and all these things. Uh, people don't even realize they're being saboteurs. So the reason I wanted to mention that client email to you is because of the strong mindset there. First of all, when he describes the training and the diet, the plan is the plan is the plan, meaning just do it, meaning he just gets on with it. He doesn't look for what's missing, doesn't look for what's not there. I give him something and he puts the blinders on, he does it, he sees the results. And then of course, being strong in the face of peer pressure to the uh, contrary. So um, you'd be surprised the nature of people when someone else is doing better and making progress in their life, how much that seems to bother other people. So I thought that was a good way to start. Um, so eventually people start understanding when they work with me with one-on-one -on -one coaching. One of the things I work on the most with people is the mindset because quality of mindset determines quality of behavior. And so that's what will determine the difference between reaching a physique goal or not reaching it. So one of the things I told you about we were going to discuss today is the most important and relevant nutritionist of the modern era and what he had to say and why 99 or 100 percent of you out there have never heard of this person um, and there's a reason you've never heard of him and it's because the fitness and diet industry can't afford for you to know what his work stood for and what his work said so this is where you would uh, really want to be um, focusing on uh, hitting the share button so we're going to get into that and then folks I'm going to debunk the DNA diet based on the work of this person. So DNA diet, another fitness diet scam that hides behind science and, and supposedly based in science, but is uh, anything but. So uh, if you guys are good to go, uh, by all means, um, you know, hit your share buttons and uh, uh, put your comments in because uh, um, I really um, can't see the emoticons uh, with this uh, new software. So uh, very, very important there. So. Um, who is this guy? Well, it's Victor Herbert. So I'm going to uh, bring up my notes as I did uh, last week, and I'm going to um, share all of that with you, of course, and uh, we will uh, go from there. Um, so who is Victor Herbert? Well, I'm going to uh, just highlight my stuff as I did last time and um, get on with showing it to you. Let me know uh, what you can see, what you can't see. Um, and I will uh, take it from there. So uh, Victor Herbert, folks, is the most relevant, important nutritionist in modern history. And why is it that 99% of you um, have never heard of him? Um, well, <laughs> because, that, like I said, the diet and fitness industry can't afford a, a, for you to have heard of him. So uh, very, very uh, important stuff. Uh, for you to know. So we're going to get right into that now. Hopefully you can all uh, see everything well. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about Victor's work. So uh, if you're looking for him right now, folks, he's not the musician. The first Victor Herbert you're going to find is a musician. He was actually named after this uh, musician. So um, yeah, just so you know. So uh, hopefully you guys can see all that. Let me know if you can't. And I will uh, raise the font or I will uh, stretch out the um, the screen some more. So um, there we go, right here. So Victor Herbert was a hematologist at Mount Sinai Medical Center. His influence in the scientific community was enormous. He produced several books, 
many book chapters, more than 850 research papers, more than 300 of which are published in indexed journals. Uh, the Institute um, for Scientific Information lists him high among the scientists whose peer-reviewed publications are the most cited worldwide by other scientists. Uh, he served <clears throat> sorry, um, he served on the editorial boards of six uh, scientific journals, sat on the uh, WHO FAO committees on nutritional anemias and on dietary requirements, and he lectured at medical institutions uh, and, and uh, professional meetings throughout the world. From 1980 to 1985, he served on the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Sciences and its RDA committees. He was president of the American Society of Clinical Nutrition, chairman of the Public Information Committee, Federation of the American Societies for Experimental Biology, chairman of the Committee on Life Sciences of the American Bar Association, and a longtime member of the Federal Interagency Committee for Human Nutrition Research. He was a scientific advisor to the American Council on Science and Health and a board member of the National Council Against Health Fraud, the latter of which is why the diet and nutrition industries do not want you to know uh, who he is. So. Um, let me just uh, drive home the next point. Um, just come up here. So hopefully you're getting a feel. These are the kind of people that I follow and I research, uh, folks. And I'm just sharing this with you because uh, I'm going to get to what he had to say and how he had to say it in a minute. So uh, hopefully his research awards. Um, Hang on, Mattis, I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing here. I'll get to your questions and stuff later. So um, his research awards included the 1972 McCollum Award and the 1986 Robert H. Herman Award, both from the American Society for Clinical Nutrition. So as you can see, that spans over a decade of, of awards. 1978 Middleton Award, um, the highest award for medical research given by the Veterans Administration, and the 1993 American Institute of Nutrition's Lifetime Fellow Award for, quote, nutrition research, teaching and unique contribution to the fight against health fraud. Again, that fight against health fraud is why the diet and fitness industry do not want you to know his work. He also received the FDA Commissioner's Special Citation Award for Public Service in 1984 for, quote, outstanding and consistent contributions against the proliferation of nutrition quackery to the American consumer, an honor honorary lifetime membership in the American Dietetic Association. So one of those awards in the mid 90s, some of them through the 80s. So as you can see, a decades and decades long uh, career at the top, not only the education, 850 research papers um, and awards coming out the wazoo. So um, do you think that uh, maybe, uh, just maybe, um, I'm going to just print that there. Do you think that maybe these credentials mean that his opinion matters and should be heard? Then why haven't you heard of him? So, Nancy, I'm, I, I got to get through the intro, Nancy, because so many people challenge what qualified people are trying to teach them because you don't know enough about their credentials. And then it just becomes another person, especially online, screaming about things. Um, that they don't know what they're talking about compared to the people who, who do. So uh, let's get into what his work uh, stood for. And then, um, you know, I will uh, tell you about why it's important and I'll get to the DNA diet. So uh, hopefully you guys can all see this. And then, uh, you know, part of education, folks, is telling you about the work of people who are truly qualified to comment as experts. So, you know, um, the intro is important in all this. Who is qualified to comment and who is not? You know, that's why it's a problem now when people say, well, enough of introducing somebody. Okay, he wrote a, he wrote a number of books. Okay, he, uh, you know, he penned 850 papers. But that's important stuff. It's important to know what the people at the top have to say. And I'll get to why that's important uh, near the bottom. So. In the early night, here's some of his work. In the early 1980s, he made headlines because two of his children's pets 
obtained a professional membership status in fancy sounding nutrition organizations whose only membership requirement was submission of a name, an address, and 50 bucks. His chapter in one nutrition textbook explained how easy it is to get one's nutrients through food, what vitamin overdoses can do, and 14 tips on how to spot a quack. Although Victor himself did not rail against supplementation with modest levels of essential nutrients as nutritional insurance, he detested the tactics used to trick people into thinking that supplements were necessary, and he warned that above RDA amounts were more likely to cause harm than good. And this latter point has now proven to be correct on so many fronts, and yet people continue swallowing their vitamins because they don't know the work of this uh, nutritional genius and his commitment uh, over the course of decades. So very, very important stuff. So um, next, let me know you guys can see this. Um, over the years, his original list of quack spotting tips has expanded and appeared in various forms in many articles, books, textbook chapters, and college course handouts. I'm going to get into that in a later uh, lecture, live lecture. I'm going to go through quack, quack, quackery uh, in the health and nutrition world and the fitness world. He also co-authored two books about the organization and dishonesty of the health food industry. Yep, that industry that you trust so much for alternative news and research about nutrition and health. And with social media, this is getting more and more perverted all the time. So he was way, way ahead of his time in terms of pointing out nonsense uh, and having people uh, keep their eye on the ball. So um, when his research really, really got important, um, some of you are going to find fascinating. He was particularly concerned about general recommendations to take antioxidants. Although ep epidemiologic and laboratory findings suggested, for example, at the time, that supplementary beta carotene and vitamin E might reduce the incidence of cancer and heart disease, Victor predicted that clinical trials would demonstrate harm. He also warned that vitamin C supplementation would increase the incidence of hemochromatosis in susceptible individuals by increasing the amount of iron they would absorb. And now, as time has shown, uh, he appears to have been correct on all accounts. If you do the research now, we see danger in taking antioxidants. We see danger in taking vitamin C. We see danger in uh hypervitaminosis uh, all across the board. And I'm going to uh, lecture on that at another time as well. So um, something I can relate to personally here um, is that he was way ahead of his time. He died in 2002, and it took research a long time to catch up to his predictions, research even coming out uh, this year as we speak. Uh, but meantime, the supplement scammers he was trying to expose ended up making millions and even billions and still do because Marketers, okay, always know how to bury the facts and twist the research in their favor. So you have to always, always, always uh, keep that in mind. Marketing will always be ahead of the research in terms of presentation and things like that. So he was also uh, known, of course, um, as a man who didn't mince words. So uh, he was ahead of his time that way as well. He was actually... Um, sick and tired of people who were trying to be diplomatic about calling out quacks. So he described the health food industry as a form of organized crime, and he referred to certain of its leaders as the quackery mafia. Consider that the next time you trust your personal trainer for supplement advice, okay? A lot of these industry fitness sites just mask all right, as supplement agendas, right? You go to these sites with all the training articles and diet articles, but really what they're doing is um, trying to get you to sign in, log in, and eventually buy into um, supplements that you don't need. So he was particularly concerned with the scientific community's unwillingness to label quack activities as such, and God bless them for that because I get attacked when I do the same thing. People love their placebos, all right, uh, and they need that. So he detested the word, uh, use of words alternative and complementary, all right, to describe methods that are unsubstantiated and lack a scientifically plausible rationale. So a lot of these health quacks, what they do is they get you to aim your gun in another direction, right? They tell you that it's the it's the medical industry, it's a pharmaceutical industry. You know, they're in a conspiracy to rob you of your money, uh, and they you know they want to keep you sick and all this other nonsense. 
um, that he pointed out. So, um, you know, this is why it's important to realize someone with his extreme credentials and what they represented, all right, um, and what he had to say. So someone with these kind of credentials is is immersed in the truth, all right? Years and years ago, he warned, he warned this, irresponsible seekers of political advantage and financial advantage, I will add, placate the masses by pimping for irresponsible alternative therapy, ignoring the fact that there's no such thing. Alternative therapy means an alternative to what works. There's no such thing as orthodox versus unorthodox therapy or establishment versus alternative therapy. These are created euphemisms uh, created by promoters of, to, of health fraud to legitimize what they do. Amen to that. There are only three kinds of therapy. One, there's therapy that works. It's more effective than doing nothing, and it is as safe as doing nothing. Or if there is any question of safety, it's the potential for benefit clearly exceeds its potential for harm. There is therapy that doesn't work. The third kind of therapy is experimental therapy. Experimental therapy, by definition, is therapy which has not yet been demonstrated to be more effective than doing nothing or as safe as doing nothing, but which is being tested to determine its safety. The promoters of various quacks, aka frauds, their remedies say the uh, medical profession is just stodgy and behind the times. Uh, these are new therapies that they don't understand. Nonsense. New means experimental. Experimental means it has not yet been shown to be more effective than doing nothing or as safe as doing nothing. Many of these quack remedies prove harmful, uh, but you'll seldom hear about that. So amen to that. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that, that proves his point, uh, we have in Canada cold FX. There's lots of these cold remedies that you buy to prevent or shorten a cold. And funny, it'll say right on the package of these things, um, works within five to seven days. Well, you know what? Within five to seven days, if you do the research, most colds have come and gone within five or seven days as well. So really, you're taking something that does nothing. All right. And then you're calling it an alternative therapy. And oh, you hide behind the placebo because you don't know any better. Really, really work for me. So this is the kind of thing. This is how it works. And the reason uh, to, to again, Nancy, to, uh, you know, to to uh, uh, explicate why I did all that intro is look at the man's credentials and why haven't you heard of him? All right. This is the kind of thing that bothers me as an academic researcher that people don't know where the knowledge coming from is being dispensed from. They don't know the difference between true scientists uh, and fraudulent quacks. And just because someone has a DR in front of their name or a PhD after their name doesn't mean they're not in an industry uh, to make a lot of money and then get out. So um, very, very important stuff. And it should be noted, one of the things that I found interesting in, in researching uh, uh, Victor, um, years ago, there was a writer, a nutrition journalist, accompanied Victor Herbert to some kind of like fitness convention, health convention type of thing. And, and not one, not two, not three, but every single booth that they attended at that convention fit the criteria for quackery. All right. Imagine that. And people often ask me why I don't go to these events anymore. That's why I don't go to these events anymore. I wouldn't be able to hold it in. I would want to friggin stand on a box and scream because of the nonsense being perpetrated as new and revolutionary and scientific. And it's all quackery. All right. So to that end, let me now talk about um, DNA diet scam. I can't believe people are still asking me about this one. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about that now. Uh, a lot of you probably signed in just for this, but if you're following what I'm saying, um, then you already know where I'm going with this. So um, one of the fitness industries uh, new, you know, it's been out for a while now. So I guess it's not new, but it follows in some old footsteps, just like, Paleo followed in Atkins and all the rest of the nonsense out there. Uh, DNA diet is a scam. Make no bones about that one, all right? So let me uh, get to the heart of it, and I'll explain some of this to you. And then I'll get to your questions and answers. So hopefully you guys are, you know, I present these live shows, folks, for the people who are interested in learning. I realize that I'm mostly um, shouting at windmills 
and people who have, who have a belief system when it comes to this stuff are going to tune in to what reinforces their opinion rather than exposing themselves to be educated about people who immerse themselves uh, in a pursuit of truth and knowledge. So I realize I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here or that people are going to have their arms folded and their hands across their ears going wah la 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 to things they don't like hearing. So be it. Um, you know, I'm here as a someone who started out looking for the truth and looking for what real science has to offer. I'll get to that near the bottom. So the dogma of diet religions is just a turn off to true researchers seeking the truth. It gets tiring being exposed to and being asked about diet religion nonsense over and over again. Low fat, low carb, keto, high protein, vegan, macros, zone, Atkins, paleo, Mediterranean, gluten free, low glycemic, raw food, SIBO, no starch, alkaline, detoxes, cleanses, metabolic typing, DNA diets, isogenics, body by V, and the rest of these religious denominations of diet religion fantasy. And that's what's happened in the modern world, folks. People are turning their diets into belief systems not science-based stuff. So they hide behind the science, all right, um, to reinforce a belief system. And I'm going to get to that. Uh, I did an experiment yesterday on my Facebook page, and I'll explain to you why it was an experiment and what it proves uh, at the bottom of this. So someone remind me of that. So, um, And then I'll get to your comments and, and questions. So, um, you know, again, I like to do my lectures, not all the time, uh, but but some of the time. So in reference to the DNA diet, if you haven't heard of it, God bless you. So um, there's the nonsense of these diet cult sleuths who greatly exaggerate the individuality of human nutritional needs and metabolism. All this metabolic typing the DNA diet's based on. In reality, metabolic individuality is more about nuance and subtlety. Sometimes ethnic and cultural background come into play, but it's, it's not about proposing that there are whole subsets of our species that have different macronutritional requirements than other members of our same species. So this would be like saying that your Wattweiler has different macronutrient needs than your pit bull who has different macronutrient needs than your German shepherd. It just doesn't make sense. So sometimes common sense just ain't so common. And then people want to dazzle you with fancy sign, uh, fancy sounding uh, scientific jargon um, when it really, really makes no sense. Now, uh, getting back um, to Nancy and why it was important to give Victor that the intro that he deserved is because I'm going to tell you now what he had to say about metabolic typing and um, DNA diet kind of stuff. So um, diet advice descends quickly into quackery, whether the person making such claims is an MD, PhD or whatever. I showed you in my initial low carb lies for profit lecture, all the lies that Dr. Atkins told uh, along the way to becoming a best-selling author. And that's all he was interested in, folks. He wasn't interested in solving weight or health problems. He was interested in selling books. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, remember, Dr. Atkins is the person who said that pork rinds, fried pork rinds are better for you than fresh fruit. Um, so uh, you got to keep these things in mind. Individual variances exist, but they're marginal at best. Core human macronutrient requirements are universal, folks. You are not a special case. Listen to anyone who buys into such nonsense, and they almost always talk like they are victims of diet nutritional circumstance. All right? In fact, the academic scientific position on blood type-based diets was bluntly summarized by Victor Herbert. Don't forget, Victor, um, you know, devoted his career to this, and he was a hematologist at Mount Sinai Medical Center. When he was asked in a CNN interview about diets to suit your blood types, his simple able-like response was, this idea is pure horse manure, no relation to reality at all. The genes for blood type have nothing to do with the genes dealing with the food we eat. Whoa, amen, brother. So let me just, uh, I'm going to just put that up on the, on the screen here for you guys. Um, all right. So the genes for blood type have nothing to do with the genes dealing with the food we eat. All right. So you've got to keep that in mind. Um, again, 
these nutritional scams online, they're going to try to convince you of something different. And when I get to talking about quackery in future lectures, you'll see how and why they do that, especially easy to do in the era of social media where everyone's an expert. Um, and really, you know, this is why you need introductions of who the experts really are, because online on social media, everyone's a chief and no one's an Indian. Um, and I'll get to that as well. So uh, very, very, very important stuff. I'm trying to show you how and why to do real research. Uh, like most fad diets that try to pretend to be scientific, uh, again, the way I debunk paleo, uh, DNA diet, the blood type diet had its moment in the sun in the late 1990s. The book was called Eat Right for Your Type or Eat Right for Your Blood Type. And then it faded into obscurity as most fad diets do. But every so often it makes a blip again on the radar screen of pop culture attention. It just comes in a different form. So the marketing gets more sophisticated. DNA diet is the latest eat right for your type nonsense. Same lame argument, same lame logic. For instance, in the past 15 to 20 years, geneticists have identified a very long list of genes that affect metabolism of carbs, fats, and proteins. The majority of these genes exist in all humans, even in other primates for that matter. What this means is that these genes are part of our human being in a species sense, as in being a homo sapiens member. And if you wanna put aside the complex science of genomes for a moment and get to the heart of the matter, uh, what all of this means for you out there uh, is that macronutrient needs of all human beings are basically the same. Epidemiological research is pretty clear about this. The real research is pretty clear on this. Let me say again, the real research is pretty clear on this. So uh, read that sentence on your screen, read it three or four times, get it through your head. Um, we need to stop the nonsense, all right? So I'm going to uh, get to your comments in a minute. I'm almost done. So um, next point. I hope you guys are liking the bullet point presentations that I'm doing so you can follow along. These are the notes I make every week for you guys. So um, as you can see, I try to put in the work. Um, now, as I said previously, genetically based individual differences in metabolism of proteins, carbs, and fats exist, but they're subtle, not diverse. It doesn't mean that you over there uh, you need 60% fat and the other person over there needs 60% carbs. Stop it. All right. These differences are subtle. None of this supports metabolic typing diets, checking your saliva and determining what your macronutrient needs should be or checking, you know, your blood. All right. Your blood types and DNA diet. I mean, yes, it's a fancy website. So what? Lots of people are, are, are technically, uh, you know, ahead of the game and they can design all kinds of stuff that look good. All right. But you need to start learning um, to not be sold on the sizzle and look for the steak. So most people are trying to sell you the sizzle and you're just not getting it. So it's important that I debunk these things a little at a time, week by week, uh, and try to get you into learning mode. So you can decipher what real research is and what it isn't and you not become guinea pigs or not become, uh, you know, uh, consumers being led by the nose into the next fad that comes down. So all these fad diets feed the misinformed rage over the importance of macronutrient profiling, which is just more diet and fitness industry nonsense about the illusion of control. I've talked about the illusion control in several of my books, Beyond Metabolism, uh, the anti-diet approach, uh, understanding metabolism. All these diets fuel the obsession with macro profiles. And, and hey, as long as it fits your macros, as, as the saying goes, then you're a person who truly looking after eating healthier and looking after yourself for your particular type than everyone else is. It's a nice ego boost and a nice placebo lead in if only it was based in actuality instead of circular logic and wishful fantasy thinking. So people who want to believe in nonsense, um, they believe in it because they want to believe in it. OK, so that's the important stuff uh, that you need to know. This is why you've never heard of Victor Herbert's work, because he was all about health fraud. Um, he would have been dead set against uh, the 1996 uh, Diet, Health, and Supplement Education Act that allowed supplement industry to run amok with the claims they make. And if you look at the political 
elements of that, uh, you're going to see that uh, Senator Orrin Hatch lined his pockets pretty good uh, with that deal, and it was more political than it was an act of legislation that benefited the consumer. So um, you can look into that on your own time. Maybe I'll do it another time. It's hard to say. Um, but being obsessed with macronutrient profiles is just more of the North American diet mentality run amok. All right, I'm just going to put that in there as well for you to see. So uh, these are these are important bullet points uh, for you to embrace and know. So the real truth is that a diet strategy that follows healthy guidelines toward whole unprocessed foods composed mostly of plants, including grains and starches. All right, let me yell that. Including grains and starches is all anyone needs to eat right for your type. That type just means being a member of the human sapien species, folks. Just like all mammals in the wild know how to eat right for their DNA type as well. We have a lot of creative science going on in the field of nutritional relativity. But when it comes to metabolic typing, eating right for your blood type, and its latest variant that you'll find in the fitness industry, the DNA diet, well, Victor Herbert, the most respected, relevant, important nutritionist of the modern era, described it best when he said, it's horse manure, despite consumers' desperate needs and desire to believe otherwise. So, again, let us just take a minute and, as I like to say, stop the nonsense. So, I'm going to post that up there. So, that's debunking the DNA diet. Totally ridiculous. Now, I did want to say that, um, yeah, so, you know, we got to who's relevant in the nutrition industry, why they're relevant, the amount of accolades and decades of work they've put in, uh, right, and then, and then look at what they had to say. So Victor Herbert was all about protecting consumers from health fraud, and yet consumers have never heard of him. That's a travesty, and the diet and fitness industry do a good job of that. So um, now I'm going to talk about diets as religions next time, but I did an experiment yesterday, um, and well in advance, I knew what I was getting into. I did it on purpose, and I knew what I was expecting. It was an experiment. So I did a quote card on the keto diet, and before I even posted it up, I told people in my personal circle, uh, watch what will happen. So um, the keto people came en masse to try to hijack the thread, okay? Um, even though I posted a little bit of research and people who have followed me know I've posted a ton of research um, that shows that uh, the keto diet um, is not a very good, very healthy diet, very healthy approach. So um, I did that quote card knowing that the ketoers would try to hijack the thread to point out the religious uh, nature of it all. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, you guys can see me, right? So I can't see my own picture anymore. Um, anyway, um, so I highlighted that. And of course, the keto dieters hijacked the thread. Um, but here was the thing, folks. Not a single person who challenged what I had to say, okay, um, was a nutritionist or someone who was steeped in research for years and years and years. Who had the most to say about supporting keto? Dieters, all right? This is the problem with belief systems. The emotional attachment to a belief system outside of the era of true research and facts. There's no way I could have spent all night presenting the research I presented to you guys in previous episodes, and it wouldn't matter, okay? It wouldn't matter. If you look at the comments there, I'm an idiot, I don't know what I'm talking about, yada, 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 but it was all from dieters, all right? So it was all people who buy into a belief system right? They need the promised land of dieting, right? And some of the people don't even know, you know, had no clue. I mean, it wasn't even worth me answering. Uh, someone asked a legitimate question on that, on the comment section. Uh, okay, then what do I, what do I propose for someone? You know, this person said someone like me who has a lot of weight to lose. And I said, well, you start with a whole foods, unprocessed, uh, diet mostly based in plants. And the next person said, that sounds like keto to me. 
Well, that has nothing to do with keto because I'm including grains. I'm including potatoes. I'm including rice. I'm including oatmeal. Um, it made no sense. So um, this is the kind of thing I did it deliberately because I knew they would try to hijack the thread and I knew it would point out exactly what I was saying. Not a single person who wanted to challenge me was a nutritionist or someone who has spent years and years doing research in the nutritional field. Now I've written 20 books, so I've spent years and years in the nutritional research field. If there was a diet where macronutrient um, portioning to the point of eliminating one, one macronutrient completely was healthy and worked for sustainable long-term dieting, I'd be all over it. Why wouldn't I? It's a no-brainer. So um, very, very important that people don't get that. So uh, as Andy Sinclair says, I can't believe emotionally attached people are to a diet to the point where they're actually seething over if you call it, call it out. Ketosis is an emergency metabolic response by the body. Uh, if not a person, a god, a religion, yet people identify themselves with a form of dieting like keto. I certainly don't identify myself with carbs because I eat a carb-based diet, and I'm not going to lose any sleep if someone else thinks it's smart to eliminate an entire food group from their life. Um, people need a defense mechanism, and it's funny. Like I said, the people who wrote in, all right, who had the most to say were chronic dieters, all right? Um, so they, they need the promised land, and until they stop seeking and looking for a promised land, realizing there isn't one, um, they're going to keep uh, diluting themselves. A lot of the other comments made no sense. It wasn't the keto diet that made the difference. People went from eating crap and not eating on a scheduled basis to all of a sudden eating healthy whole foods, and they gave keto the credit for it. This is, this is the lack of education that I'm talking about, folks. So very, very important. Um, I'm getting to your comments now. So Tracy says, I have a client uh, who is constantly being diagnosed with something new of recent Lyme disease. Ooh, there's a whole thing on WebMD about Lyme disease, Tracy. You might want to check that out. Um, every week he receives chelation and vitamin IVs. Oh, hey, don't get me started on chelation therapy. Uh, before my very eyes, he gets sicker and is now addicted to the lifestyle of getting well versus just being well. Yeah, everyone is some nutritional boogeyman they've got to overcome, like, uh, you know, gluten and SIBO and, you know, like, oh, I've just, you know, if it wasn't for this, you know, and like I said uh, last week, you're not overweight because you have these issues, you have these issues because you're overweight. People need to, uh, you know, um, a little a little less wishbone and a little more backbone when it comes to personal responsibility. So uh, very important point there. So um, let me get to your other questions. Anybody uh, comments? Uh, I do want to get to your comments on, on the actual show, but um, since Mattis is uh, asking a question early on, I should get to it. Uh, Scott, please help. I'm following the cycle diet. I've caught a stomach bug from my son and vomited all night. Yeah. Uh, today I feel much better. Hunger's kicking in. Um, I have no taste for cosmetically friendly foods. I feel like I'm in, uh, and I do have a taste for a sweet drink. My body needs quick calories. Yeah, if you've been sick and, you know, you're, there's a lot of diuresis and vomiting and things like that, so you lose your fluids. Um, you have a photo shoot tomorrow. Yo, okay. Um, then I would just load, load up on, on, you know, food that you can stomach, food that's pretty easy to stomach. So maybe uh, uh, some easy protein, uh, lean protein sources with some white rice. Uh, eat that all day and uh, you should be pretty good. Um, so hopefully uh, that answers that. Um, I had a, a situation like that, funny enough, uh, a long time ago. I had a situation like that uh, for a competitor who caught a stomach bug just before competition, like three days out. And uh, it flattened him out totally because he had both ends going, uh, vomiting and diarrhea and things like that. And he, he, you know, he was someone who was high level, high caliber competitor and should and could win a contest. So uh, what I had him do was ask him what his favorite um, penny candies are and uh, to go out and get a bunch of them. So we bought licorice and uh, jujubes and things like that. And I made sure that uh, he started eating them right in front of all the other competitors because um, they didn't know his last three days history like I knew his last days, three days history and knew his body. So I had him drinking a lot of water and then I had him um, carving up on penny candy uh, with um, 
lots of hydration. Uh, the first day, of course, there was a little bit of stomach bloating because there was still the stomach issue to deal with, but I knew that would subside, and I also knew that those sugar calories would be sucked right into his muscle because not only was he depleted by training and dieting for the stage anyway, then he got the stomach bug. So I knew I had a ton of room to maneuver. So I loaded him up on penny candy um, and I had everyone else see him do it. And sure enough, monkey see, monkey do, all these other wannabe coaches who wanted to be me went and had their clients eating penny candy, and of course it ruined their physiques. They were holding water and they couldn't figure out why their stomachs were bloated because they didn't go through the same <laughs> exact biochemical experience of being sick three days before. So the monkey see, monkey do thing is uh, very, very alive and well in this industry. So you know, keep that in mind too. So uh, very important stuff. Um, Troy's just saying, Scott, it can go the other way too. We shouldn't assume uh, a zealot because someone says the word low carb made this mistake, chastising my sister-in-law for doing keto. Then I asked what she, turns out she wasn't even low carb. She only thought she was. She was just using terms she heard uh, inaccurately describing what she was eating. I felt bad. Don't feel bad. This is the problem with the lack of education out there, Troy. Like I said in the example I used, when I uh, advised that person, overweight person yesterday, the comment right, right below it was, that sounds like keto to me. It was nothing to do with keto, nothing to do at all with keeping carbs at a certain level and worse, making sure your body's in a state of ketosis. So people banter around these terms without even really truly understanding them. And that is what's problematic. And that is why, you know, um, I also, you know, spent so long introducing uh, Victor Herbert um, in terms of credentials, credentialed, experienced people in what they have to say. And like I say, yesterday, it was very interesting, the people that came on board to try to uh, bomb that uh, Facebook post of mine, hi try to hijack that thread, were dieters, okay? They weren't nutrition experts. They weren't someone with degrees in biochemistry. They weren't nutritional researchers. If you look at the people with decades-long experience, in researching the field, you'll find very few who support any kind of keto diet for any reason. Look at Dr. Diana Schwartzbean, look at myself, look at T. Colin Campbell, look at Victor Herbert. That's why it's important to sometimes know the who's who of who's saying and doing what. So uh, very, very important as well. Uh, Scott's just saying that uh, diet fads uh, perhaps provide the excuse for failure. Yeah, some of them because it's like it's like what I said with the DNA diet, uh, Scott. It gives people something to hide behind, right? Oh, I didn't know for, from my blood type I should be eating 60% carbs. I've been eating 60% fats or vice versa, you know, uh, because I'm type O. Didn't you know that? And, you know, things like that. And Or like I said, people just clean up their diet and then they give credit to something like keto, even though they're not in ketosis, they're not following a keto diet. All they did was they stopped eating crap and they stopped snacking. And then they give credit to the label that they read, like Troy was saying about his sister-in-law. So very, very important, you know, and then they start following all this other gimmick nonsense, right? Not only are they keto dieting, but they're intermittent fasting on top of that. And they're drinking bulletproof coffee uh, and all this other diet industry facade nonsense, right? And you can't get through to people like that uh, with research, without research. Um, you know, uh, it's just, again, nonsensical. So, you know, what I presented, like this week, we launched my Hard Gainer Solution course, right? And I showed you before and afters of several people, not to mention, okay, protege Andy Sinclair is on board with us, okay? He's been in, in photo shoot, cover model shoot shape, for 13 years now eating a carb-based diet, all right? So, you know, that's not someone who's a yo-yo dieter. That's not someone who's lost 50 pounds and still has 50 pounds more to lose, you know, glorifying a diet, all right? All my physique transformation people eat carb-based diets. And I, I showed you in my previous lectures on that, um, you know, what the research shows about long-term sustainability. I posted another research article yesterday in that thread about keto nonsense, um, which nobody wanted to pay much attention to, uh, and that's fine. So, um, 
Uh, Tracy made a, made a good comment here. Well, let me just see. Tracy's just saying, uh, why has the food and diet become a source of punishment and pain? It's supposed to be joyful. Not supposed to be joyful, but the way you sell things, Tracy, the number one thing when my business manager, Mike, signed on with me is Mike said, you have to present a problem and you have to present a solution to it. You have to solve an individual specific problem. One of the ways the fitness and diet industry do it is sleight of hand by saying, it's not your fault. It's not your lack of discipline. It's not your lack of sacrifice. It's not your lack of commitment. Didn't you know that you're eating wrong for your DNA type? You're eating wrong for your blood type? Didn't you know you're gluten intolerant? Um, didn't you know you have SIBO? Didn't you know you're carb resistant? Um, all of these things, you know, like I said earlier, when I read uh, at the beginning my client email, when he said the training is the training is the training and the diet is the diet is the diet, meaning he's just following it and doing what it takes and he's successful at it, whereas other people will write me within weeks, can I do this instead of that? Can I have this instead of that? Oh, this really isn't convenient for me. This isn't really practical. That's not how you reach goals and that's not how you change a life and that's not how you sustain a transformation. But people want, they think that they're, Goals should be reachable within what they conceive as doable. And uh, you have to meet change on changes terms. You can't meet change on your own terms. So that's very, very important as well. So uh, very good um, point, Tracy. But the food and diet industry, like Victor Herbert said, is, uh, is quackery mafia. All right. First, they have to present to you a problem that only they can solve with their nonsense so that you will buy in. All right. And then they solve that issue by telling you you have the problem to begin with. Right. Uh, first of all, you have this specific problem and your DNA proves it. All right. So this goes back to something that Warren Buffett said in terms of getting financial advice. Warren Buffett said, never ask a barber if you need a haircut. And what he meant by that was never ask someone in an industry who stands to profit from telling you you need what they have to sell you, okay? So of course, someone's gonna believe in protein powder who sells protein powder. Of course, someone's gonna believe in branched chain amino acids who sells branched chain amino acids. Of course, someone's gonna believe in the nonsense of GH boosters and, and uh, testosterone boosters who sells that ridiculous stuff. Uh, I've debunked this stuff over and over again, and you know what my reach is on that compared to the reach of the people who sell it? My reach is like this, and their reach is expansive because people need to believe in magic. People need to believe in the promised land. Um, the diet and fitness industry has been shoving this down their throats for decades. Um, so um, just so you know, this is how it's worked. And this is why Victor Herbert was the most important and relevant researcher of his time. Remember, two of his children, pe children's pets got certified in fancy sounding nutritional certification protocols before the internet even existed, before social media even existed. You know what's going on now? Uh, I know people that have written the personal trainer certification multiple choice programs for their spouses to get them certified so that they could double you know, the amount of people they could train. I know uh, another person in my old ABLE forums, he had his pet certified in an online, um, a very popular um, personal training certification course. This stuff goes on and on and on. And when I get to quack, quack, quackery in a couple of weeks, uh, you'll see how and why this works. Uh, people create their own organizations now, right? In Canada, we have CanFit, which was created by Good Life Fitness. And then if you wanna be a trainer at Good Life, you have to pay first to take the CanFit course. So they profit whether you become a personal trainer or not. Their turnover rate is incredible because the people can't make any money. But so before you even become a personal trainer, before you even know if you can sustain that lifestyle and make money from it, you've already paid for the CanFit personal trainer course. So they've made their money. All right, by promising you that you're certified in a weekend. Certified does not mean qualified. Um, so that's very, very important. Uh, Scott just wants me to know, hey coach, you're getting lots of likes, dozens actually, just uh, for your information, because so, you can't see them. Yeah, I, can, I can't see them with this software. Uh, I think this is a good, 
um, trade-off for this software, folks. I think that uh, having this uh, software allows you guys to see the notes that I make, the research that I do. I wish I had this software early on when I did the whole six-week low-carb lies lecture series. You would have had all of that research uh, to copy and paste right there yourself. So, um, you know, really, really um, important stuff there. So I'm just going to uh, find that again. Um, whoops. Uh, da, da, da. Trying to hide that comment, but uh, I can't find it. So <laughs> uh, there we go. So other comments are coming in, and I'm just going to uh, question about protein needs um, from John Johnny. Um, the macro guideline in HGS says 40% protein, but it sounds quite a bit high compared to one of your podcasts where you're talking about protein needs. Why is that? Um, and thanks for the hard gainer solution course. Just joined in yesterday. Um, have been doing hard gainer already for five months, three to four workouts per week. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Always glad when my work benefits from people. Uh, Yanni, the thing, and I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry. There's so many people from all over the world and they all have different uh, pronouncements, but the macro guideline in the hard gainer solution, Yanni, is because I have to speak in generalities when I'm addressing a mass audience and I have to speak in terms they understand. So I use macro guidelines loosely because as you can see with the DNA diet and all of that, um, these things don't need to be that specific. I don't want people married to macronutrient profiles. I know Andy doesn't know um, his macronutrient profile in, in numbers. I don't know mine and I've been lean for decades. Andy's been lean for, for 13 years, cover shoot ready lean. Um, so, you know, we got to get away from the numbers, from the outside in approach, and we got to start honoring the biofeedback of the body. Uh, that's how you get there. So um, good, good point there. Hopefully that makes sense to you, Yanni, and I'm glad you got the uh, the program. It's, uh, yeah, it's doing really well uh, as well. So Jock says, are the meal plans and the hard gainer solution uh Carb-based. Well, I have different meal plans in there, um, Jock. Uh, there's even a vegan uh, approach there. So we tried to cover all the bases there with, um, you know, what people, uh, how people eat and what they eat and things like that. And again, it's more of a guideline. And then I teach people how to use biofeedback to gauge that. So um, Perry's just saying, you know, nowadays there's more diets, nutrition and fitness advice than ever. And people are fatter and sicker than ever. And a lot of people are buying into um, that whole notion that they're sick. There's something wrong with me. I'm a victim to nutritional circumstance. And 99% uh, of the time, no, you're not. You just want to be. So, And you need to believe in that. And like I said yesterday, it's the belief system in a promised land, right? Like that's what people um, – I had to delete – and even ban people who commented on my keto thread yesterday because of the nonsense. I just wasn't going to let them hijack that thread when I know better, uh, regardless of what they had to say. So, um, you know, that, that doesn't do anybody any good to allow people who believe in magic to propagate magic. I just won't um, allow that. So Tracy's just saying uh, people think low carb is keto. It's not. They will eat low carb and high protein, and keto is not high protein. It's extremely high fat. Uh, most who think they're in keto simply don't know what they're doing, and that's the danger. Well, that you know, the blind leading the blind out there. Uh, like I said, most of the people who responded yesterday, Tracy, on my on my post were were dieters. They weren't nutritionists. They weren't people steeped in research. Uh, they were just people who you know treat diet like religion because they need to. Um, so let's just go. Uh, my boy here, Andrea from South Africa, someone who sends me a lot of this research that I share with you. Um, he's just saying currently it's popular to claim that keto diets can cure or treat everything under the sun, including cancer. Um, the systematic uh, review that he's sending, and he quotes, the system, uh, systematic review therefore prevents and uh, presents and evaluates the clinical evidence on isocaloric um, dietary regimens and reveals that the evidence supporting the effects of isocaloric ketogenic dietary regimens 
on tumor development and progressions as well as reduction in side effects of cancer therapy is misleading. Okay, so there you go uh, there, and I just read that uh, uh, spur, spur of the moment. So, um, you know, very, very important stuff. And as Scott says, advertisers invert, they create the problem and then present a solution. Exactly my point, Scott, exactly v Victor Herbert's point as well, right? Like, um, you know, Victor Herbert was an advocate against the health and fitness and diet industries and health fraud trying to protect the consumer. And yet, if I posted his conclusions without his credentials attacked, the social media tribes would attack him without realizing uh, he devoted his life to trying to protect the exact people who would attack him. And I know what that feels like because I've done the same thing. When my sodium article first came out, you wouldn't believe what I had to endure uh, because it was during the low sodium days that low sodium solved everything. And then I came out with this article about the benefits of sodium, especially if you work out. And uh, at first, boy, was I lambasted. Um, and then even um, Muscle Mag wanted me to print a retraction. I said, I'm not going to retract something that's true. And then within five, six years, the research started building up on the benefits of sodium, especially if you work out. And, and they were even asking, it was funny because I had to go in and edit the sodium article and add to it because uh, they were asking Venus Williams one or Serena Williams, whichever Williams sister is the one with all the championships. Um, what, one of her secrets was why she's doing so well. And she said, yeah, she puts a teaspoon of, of salt in her Gatorade and that allowed her to uh, sustain strength much longer throughout longer tennis matches. So I had to go back in and include that in my sodium, sodium article on the benefits of sodium. I think it's called Sodium Unsung Hero of People Who Work Out or something like that. But when it first came out in the anti-sodium days, whoa, boy, was I lambasted. But just like my client who took a lot of bull crap at work this week uh, in the last couple of weeks because of how well he's doing, and he just sort of acknowledged it and uh, observed it and scratched his head about it but wasn't affected by it, I did the same thing. I knew I was right, and I knew the research would catch up eventually. Victor Herbert did the same thing. He talked about hypervitaminosis. He talked about the dangers of antioxidants and vitamin C, and now the research has proven him to be right on all accounts. As a matter of fact, uh, the mortality rate of people who take vitamins is higher than the people who don't, as long as they're, if you control for people who eat healthy in general. So uh, no thank you, I'll pass on the vitamin supplements and uh, I don't think anyone uh, will ever uh, convince me otherwise. So, um, oh, Pam just made a good comment. Um, this will age me, but during the Atkins phase of quackery, I remember reading that being in ketosis is a precursor to diabetes. Those that were on it back in the 90s are now diabetics. Have you run across this or read about this? Well, uh, Pam, I don't know. I probably have and maybe I forgot it. I ran across a lot of the Atkins quackery, a lot of the lies that Atkins told that were proven. I mean, because they were quoted. I mean, he said things on CNN interviews and then his wife uh, made other lies and then they tried to hide his weight at the time of his death. And and like I said, the, the pork rinds being healthier than fresh fruit and him saying that, you know, bananas are toxic and just, I mean, he was full of all kinds of quackery nonsense, but he had the word doctor in front of his name and it had the magic that people wanted. Carbs are the villain. Let's demonize carbs. You're not fat because of your lifestyle and how you eat. You're fat because of these nasty carbohydrates, don't you know? And the other thing with keto and low carb that I have to point out, folks, is the short-term honeymoon effects. Everyone falls in love because these things are meant to work up front, all right? They're meant without any consideration for metabolic consequences down the road. So uh, now it's being shown in the research over and over again that metabolism will slow down and compensate for the lack of energy coming in, triggered by the lack of glycogen stores that are depleted because of a lack of starch carbohydrates. So, uh, And I've presented that before, so... Uh, Anyway, I think for today, folks, I'm way over my time. I hope you guys benefited from this. If you did, throw some emoticons across the screen. Um, and uh, anything, any topics you want me to discuss, by all means, drop me a line. Let me know. I'd be happy to do that. I have a lot of things lined up for the next few weeks. But, um, again, uh, Victor Herbert, 
the most important and relevant nutritionist in modern history trying to protect you all from health fraud and what he called the quackery mafia in the fitness and diet industry, especially against promoting that we need supplements uh, when that's the furthest thing from the truth. And then the DNA diet scam, folks. Let's just uh, finish with me putting that uh, putting that up there, um, the DNA diet scam. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys will recognize these things when you see them because they're going to keep coming out in different forms. About every five years, a former – uh, nutrition strategy to make money will reappear just couched in a different form. So the DNA diet scam is built upon the eat right for your blood type scam of the 90s. Um, South Beach diet was built upon Atkins. Paleo was built upon those two things and on and on it goes. This is all about making money. It's not about, um, you know, trying to solve problems for the consumer uh, like many of you have said, it's about creating <laughs> problems um, for the consumer that only they can solve. So um, hopefully you guys have benefited from this. Uh, you know, I'm glad to have you out there. Hopefully you've been hitting your share button all along. If not, do so after the fact, please. Uh, let's get people trying to understand a little better than they do. And again, let's not uh, believe in magic and believe in hype. So uh, let's get that going out there. Uh, and so. Uh, with that, I will leave you till next week, and I'm sure I'll have something interesting and provocative for you, educational for you next week as well. So with that said, um, throw your likes across the screen, even though I can't see them, and uh, hit your share buttons uh, when this is over. And I sure hope that you uh, found something educational in today's lecture, and I will see you all next week.